So from uh, making cars with the community to making marine parks with the community, I'm very happy to be here to have a chance to talk to you about some fairly monumental marine issues that I'm involved in, in dealing with. I'm going to be talking about conservation, about fisheries, a little bit about economics and, and not too much about politics. Most of all, I'm going to be talking about, about communities. The theme of, of addressing the state of the world's oceans really is very relevant to, to the Do lectures because dealing with some of the problems I'm going to introduce really is going to require an enormous amount of doing in our lifetimes if we're going to be able to avert some fairly catastrophic consequences. And my objective, what I hope to be able to do, is to demonstrate to you the enormous power and responsibility that we all have as collective doers to effect lasting positive change on these issues. And I want to start by way of a story. It's a story about a people and a place. The people are the Vezu. They're a subsistence coastal community of African origin that depend on the sea and a seafaring way of life for subsistence, for, for income, even their very cultural identity. And the place is the incredibly remote, arid southwest coast of the island of, of Madagascar. Vezu means literally to struggle with the sea. And, and Vezu identity is very closely related to a seafaring way of life, to sailing. It's all about fishing. This is the Vezu identity. They sail, dug out canoes, often dozens of kilometers out into the ocean to catch fish. Boys will learn to sail almost before they can walk. And they really are some of the most accomplished navigators I've ever worked with. Just by way of a, a little biological digression, I'm a, I'm a marine biologist by training. Um, what drew me to Madagascar? Well, Madagascar, as many of you will know, is the hottest of the hot terrestrial biodiversity hotspots. That means it's a mega diversity country. It's home to unparalleled numbers of species of plants and animals, most of which occur nowhere else on Earth. Um, not just that, but these species are facing monumental threats, threats due to deforestation, to land degradation. We heard a lot about soil yesterday from Peter. Madagascar's lost almost all of its topsoil. And it was these critical conservation issues that drew me as a biologist to Madagascar 10 years ago. I now work there as a social entrepreneur and a conservationist, developing business solutions to, to environmental problems, scalable economic incentives for conservation, which I'll come on to. But this is the spiny forest. This is one of the world's most extraordinary terrestrial forest habitats. And this is where the Vezu live. Arriving here fresh from a plane, you could be forgiven for thinking you'd landed on Mars. So absolutely bizarre are many of the animals and plants that you'll see there. And underwater, this region is home to one of the largest coral reefs on Earth. It stretches for about 500 kilometers up the coast of the Mozambique Channel. Most of it's totally unknown to science. And it's this reef that provides the very basis of the Vezu fishing economy. These communities are totally dependent on these reefs for absolutely everything. Now, I've lived in and worked with Vezu communities for a number of years, and I'd love to stand here and eulogize about the beauty and the simplicity of, of Vezu culture and the Vezu way of life. But instead, I want to focus on, on a major problem that these people face. The Vezu are, are probably amongst the most geographically isolated and economically marginalized people on Earth. They're quite literally living on the edge, on the edge of the island continent, on the edge of the global economy, on the edge of Malagasy society. They're dealing with the brunt of a very rapidly changing oceanic climate, having contributed to climate change almost nothing themselves, very unlike those of us here in this room today. In this region, there's no real roads to speak of. There's no communications infrastructure. There's very little access to markets. The nearest city to many villages will be a three or four day sail away. Children, well, only about a third will make it to primary school. Very few will finish secondary education. Over half are stunted from malnutrition. One of the things I want to mention is that as a conservationist, I'm often struck by the extent to which we as humans seem inclined to forget the degree to which ecosystems and habitats have changed over time. We seem to have this collective societal forgetfulness about the way habitats used to look, about ecosystem health. This man will tell us that when he was a boy, it used to be faddy or taboo for him to fish, for, sorry, for him to swim in his lagoon at dawn or dusk for fear of getting nibbled by a shark. Today, the chances of seeing a shark here are very, very slim. Now, I might think that that's a pretty significant observation. But as scientists, if we can't quantify these changes, if we can't measure them, we're often inclined to forget them. And I just want to mention that I think it's incredibly dangerous when we as a society start to forget the way 
the environment once looked. And in this particular region, we're very lucky because 45 years ago, the French had a research station on this very reef, and it was one of, then one of the best studied bits of the ocean in the whole world. A lot of this work is written up in this seminal publication by Smithsonian Institution, which was published before I was even born. And we can delve into this massive tome and find an insight into the way this sea used to look. We see in these pictures, some of the earliest underwater pictures, an incredible complexity of habitat. We see, we read of a massive resident biomass of fish, huge abundant sharks, in short, a pristine ecosystem that hasn't really been interfered with. It hasn't been subject to the forces of degradation that we see today. We can compare this to what we see today. I took these pictures last year. We see an indescribable loss of obviously the coral that's been replaced by slime, by plants. The fish are also absent now. The very habitat is starting to erode, it's disappearing. The reef has ceased to be a reef. This has no resilience, it won't ever come back. The cause is, well, perhaps unsurprisingly, global climate change, which has wreaked havoc on many of the world's coral reefs, but none more so than here in the west of the Indian Ocean, right over on the far side by Africa. Also the usual suspects, pollution, sedimentation from that deforestation I mentioned, and chronic local threats like overfishing and destructive fishing. And as a conservationist, it's really only the local threats that we can mitigate as field practitioners. It's really only the local fishing-related impacts. We can't deal with climate change, sadly, at a local level. Now, back to the Vezu. Well, the Vezu are traditionally a migratory people. They're nomads. They're sea nomads. Traditionally, they migrate with the seasons or with fisheries. So migration, human migration, has been something of a safety valve for the problems of resource degradation, for the problems of overfishing. Um, Traditionally, this worked, but in recent years, the human population on this coast has followed an opposite trajectory to the health of the marine resources. Today, Vezu women give birth to seven children on average, and many villages will double their population in 10 to 15 years. Half of Vezu girls will be pregnant before the age of 15. All of these demographic pressures obviously put unprecedented threats and stresses on the marine environment. And to deal with these unprecedented threats, today's Vezu are migrating further and for longer and in greater numbers than ever before. Every April, as soon as the last of the cyclones has passed up the Mozambique Channel, whole families will pack up their entire belongings into open canoes and head out, heading north in search of offshore banks and islands where the, where the fishing pressure is less. This picture, I'm not sure if you can quite see it, but you can see a whole families migrating with beds, chairs, a generator, even a roof. They'll spend months living on offshore banks and islands in incredibly bleak conditions, like here in the very aptly named Barren Islands Archipelago, where groups of migrants, hundreds strong, will eke out a living with no shade, no fresh water, no vegetation. Many of these islands are actually awash at spring high tide. That means they're inundated, and at such times, families literally will have to load all their possessions back into their canoes, jump in with them, throw an anchor overboard, and hope to high heaven that the boat holds onto the island when the spring tide rises up, and that hopefully that spring tide won't coincide with the darkest night of the year or perhaps a storm surge that might blow them off their reef. Why are they doing it? Well, their quest is sharks and sea cucumbers, which, um, which are sold onto local collectors, who sold them on, sell them onto international markets, particularly in Southeast Asia. Now, I'm told that shark fin soup is a, is a fishy, tasteless goo, and that Viagra does a much better job than sea cucumbers as an aphrodisiac. But despite this, the market demand for these fisheries is so strong that many fishermen will risk their lives for the catch fishermen sailing 100 kilometers out to sea to lay a shark net, or diving beyond the safe limits of breath holding to gather sea cucumbers may commonly never return. And beyond the, the, the human impacts, the ecological consequences of these fisheries are devastating beyond belief, not just to the sharks and the sea cucumbers, but through cascading ecological impacts to just about every other level of the marine food web. Globally, about 90% of large predatory fish populations like this have, have disappeared as a result of overfishing like this. Competition is incredibly fierce for these resources amongst Vezu, amongst different fishermen. But today they're having to contend with forces far beyond their control. Industrial fisheries fleets, often perversely subsidized by foreign fishing interests, notably here in the EU, ply the waters around these Vezu cano canoes. There's negligible surveillance, nothing to stop them taking the top off a coral reef. <coughs> This image to me really sums up the, the challenge, the enormity of the challenge facing one of the world's most marginalized people. Um, 
Now the question is, why am I here in Wales telling you this, frankly, somewhat bleak story? Well, against this backdrop, this quite desperate backdrop, there are some incredibly positive signs of hope from which I think we can all learn, especially here in the UK. Because these communities have acted. They've, recognising the severity of the threats, they've come together. They've joined in coastal management associations, laying down traditional laws that govern access to the sea, use of the sea. They're traditionally an animist people. So these laws are laid down after consulting their ancestors in these very sacred ceremonies known as fumba, like this one. And, they mean that, and that means that what they do is held in very, very high regard by the communities that they're working with. Things like this, they're, they're eliminating destructive fishing. They're, they're outlawing destructive fishing. This is using a, a modified mosquito net to dredge across a very vulnerable, shallow, lagoonal environment. They're not just outlawing and banning these fishing techniques. They're making them totally socially unacceptable. They use environmental education to raise awareness of destructive fishing. We call it social marketing. <laughs> education to bring about profound, lasting behavior change. It's been done for years in the field of development and public health. These guys are doing it for conservation. They create marine reserves to give stocks an opportunity to recover, fish to grow. And they use traditional knowledge to identify areas to protect, priority areas to protect. This is a, a marine reserve in the Indian Ocean. It's the largest community managed marine reserve in the Indian Ocean, just off Madagascar. It covers 800 square kilometres. That's more coast than is protected in, in the whole of the UK. It brings together 10,000 people from 25 villages, collectively, democratically managing their marine resources. And nobody is paid to do this. Why are they doing it? Because they see the economic incentive. They see that conservation actually pays and they're getting on with it. They realise that without conservation, their community has quite literally reached the end of the line. And it's not just about fisheries and reserves. These communities are pioneering innovative alternatives to fishing, empowering women through alternative livelihoods, farming sea cucumbers, as you can see here, and also seaweed. They, they're even using barefoot family planning clinics to enable women in some of the remotest islands in the whole of East Africa to have access to sexual and reproductive health services and take control of their own lives and their own reproductivity for the first time. Some of the models that these guys have developed on their own without much outside help, self-funded and self-organized, have been replicated nationally and internationally. They've scaled virally up and down these coasts, these enterprise-based models demonstrating the economic incentive for conservation. Incredibly powerful. And this has gone on amidst a backdrop of a, a major military coup last year and an almost complete breakdown in national environmental governance, which is ongoing and has been the case for, for a couple of years. I want to ask a quick question. If you're a subsistence fisherwoman, what does it mean to set up a marine reserve in your backyard? Well, to me, it means overcoming the tragedy of the commons. It means it means collectively realising a shared vision, foregoing today's catch, today's profit, on the off chance that the broader community might, and that's a very big might, but might just benefit tomorrow. But for someone living on a lot under a dollar a day like this woman, maybe a dollar every few days, that's an enormous risk to take. In our world, I liken that risk to the entire city of London collaboratively and unanimously deciding to increase income tax, say, across the entire city on the off chance that that increase in revenue might just get reinvested back into the city, into the community in future. It's a gesture of philanthropy and forward planning that we in the West can't even manage, can't even consider. And yet these guys, some of the poorest on earth, have done it and it's working. I mean, this is, this is a truly incredible achievement. And this has really been a, the focus of a lot of my work for the, for the last few years. As I said, I run a social enterprise that, that promotes this kind of work internationally, not just in Madagascar, and we're based in London. But I don't really want to focus on that, my own work at the moment, because I want to try to draw some parallels between what these guys have achieved and where we are in the UK and in Northern Europe with regards to our own marine environment. How does a much richer economy, a much richer society face with similar environmental challenges? Well, in the EU, about 88% of assessed fish stocks are overfished and 30% are beyond biological reference points which means that they're in basically imminent danger of collapsing. And then there's the fisheries that, that, and the stocks that aren't monitored and aren't regulated through quotas, about which we know next to nothing. We can really only imagine the impact of overfishing on these unmonitored stocks. The nature of the way we enforce quota legislation in Europe means that our fishermen 
are routinely throwing about 50% of their catches overboard. We simply refer to these wasted but perfectly edible fish as discards and they're, they're, not, they're very rarely monitored. This image shows the impact of bottom trawling off the Louisiana coast. Each pixel on that is 30 meters, that's taken from the Landsat satellite. And here again in uh, eastern China. Trawling like this, industrial bottom trawling, has caused the greatest transformation, human transformation, of marine environments ever seen. The North Sea seabed used to be an incredibly productive habitat of complex oyster beds and sponge ecosystems. But decades of steel cables, chains, steel rollers and sheer engine power have literally pulverised that living matrix into what we see today throughout the North Sea and much of the North Atlantic, which is sediment, its slime, its boulders. We learnt in Nature, the publication this year, that our trawlermen in the UK are having to fish 17 times harder than their Victorian counterparts to land the same number of fish. Now that means that the British sail-powered trawling fleet in the late 1800s was catching more fish than today's incredibly technologically sophisticated vessels. So inevitably we, we mask this decline by fishing deeper, we fish harder, we, we have technological innovation, we fish further down food webs, we target species we'd never have considered eating as a primary source of food 50 years ago, and increasingly we mask this decline by fishing further and further afield. In West Africa, which is one of the world's most productive fisheries, the waters are literally mined by subsidised European boats. And of course this whole process is, um, is subsidised by public funds, our public funds, to keep affordable fish on our tables. About 50% of the world's industrial fishing capacity, and especially that in Europe, is, is superfluous, it's obsolete, we simply don't need it. And yet, shockingly, a lot of your public money is still going into modernising the fleet. A lot of our subsidy still goes towards increasing capacity, modernising vessels, making vessels that can fish further and harder and deeper and in new habitats. And yet we know that without these subsidies, these very perverse subsidies, what the, the whole industry would be uneconomic. So we're perpetuating it nonetheless, but we know that it's long since, since ceased to be ecologically viable or economically viable. So how did we get it so wrong in, in the UK and in, in Europe? Well, our leaders are very sadly, our fisheries ministers, have been turning their backs on the scientific advice that our own fisheries scientists give them for, for decades, in fact. And we could say that our leaders are complicit in prioritising a continued uninterrupted supply of fish to our tables over any real concern for the ecological viability of the catch. And of course, governmental appeasement of industrial fishing interests in this way is dangerously counterintuitive because ultimately the overfishing that we're subsidising will bring about the end of the industry that we're trying to support, ultimately bringing fishing communities, fishermen, fisheries, the entire system to its knees. I just want to have a, a quick digression. An, an incredible example of this short-sightedness came in March this year with efforts to, to protect this fish, which is the bluefin tuna. Um, it's one of the most incredible animals on earth. The bluefin tuna can accelerate faster than one of the local motors cars. It can accelerate faster than a Ferrari. They can migrate a thousand kilometers. They dive to a thousand meters. They can even regulate their own body temperature, which is almost unheard of in a fish. This, this fish used to be so abundant in the North Atlantic that fishermen in East Yorkshire could pull them in with a line from the beach. Indeed, a catch record for the 1930s was of a bluefin that was landed weighing half a metric tonne. Unfortunately, these fish haven't been back to the North Sea or East Yorkshire for quite a long time, poor them, um, because it's so endangered nowadays. And it's endangered because individual fish can fetch, fetch up to 100,000 US dollars on international sushi markets. WWF conservatively estimate that the spawning stock, that's the sexually reproductive adults of this species, will be eradicated by 2012. The fish will be finished by 2012. That gives us a year to act, and we had an incredible, unprecedented opportunity to do just that in March this year at a meeting, the three yearly meeting of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, which is an a, a international forum. And the, um, the bluefin was up for Appendix 1 listing, which basically means that if it had got it, all international trade in this critically endangered fish would have been banned and that would have had a massive impact on depressing the market demand for the species. But unfortunately, at the meeting, governments abandoned the science and the conservation in favour of trade and voted overwhelmingly against the proposal to give it any protected status or any CITES listing, convention listing, whatsoever. So it does seem that overwhelmingly, when we weigh up, in the one hand, the imminent extinction of one of the world's most 
magnificent animals. And then in the other, our own short-term ecological well-being, ec economic well-being, that governments will, political decisions that are taken to legislate on fisheries, let us down every bit as much as those taken to, to legislate, for instance, climate change. The current system is clearly just not working. Business Trump science again and again and again. A few years ago, we learned that based on current trajectories of decline, all global stocks of fish and shellfish that we currently exploit globally will have collapsed by 2048. I find that an incredibly frightening statistic. It's simply unacceptable that our natural capital, our global commons, our own fisheries resources are being squandered in this way. We're, I believe that we're really put to shame by the, the courage and the vision of the Vezu, because unlike the Vezu, who do not live in a functioning democracy, who do not have access to political processes and systems and mechanisms through which they can influence policy and drive change, unlike the Vezu, we do have a voice and we can use it, but we're not doing it. We're clearly not doing enough. So big do and little do, what can we actually do? Um, well, in Europe, upcoming reform of our common fisheries policy in 2012 represents our best chance yet to reduce that overcapacity, to bring it in line with the available resource, and also to eliminate some of those perverse subsidies that I mentioned. Consumer and environmental groups across Europe are coming together in this new coalition called Ocean 2012. It's designed to broaden the debate, get more people like you involved. If governments like the VESU can see beyond the short-term economic costs and realize the long-term benefits of a healthy ocean, then we're in with a chance. We can't allow the CFP, the Common Fisheries Policy, to fail, but fisheries reform, in my opinion, alone isn't enough. We also need to set aside areas of ocean as biological reserves, as rest areas where fish and stocks can recover, just as these fishermen in Madagascar have managed to achieve. I took this photograph a few years ago in the Chagos Archipelago. It's a, an area of the Indian Ocean that's since become the largest marine reserve on Earth. And it's, it's about the size of southern England. And it's this kind of macro scale conservation that we need to be thinking about if we're going to give our oceans a chance to recover from the decades of, of abuse and, and misuse that we've wielded on them. Um, we've got a long way to go. Currently, about 1% of the world's oceans are protected. And only by about 1 5,000th of the oceans is actually zoned as no take. Science says we need to take that to 30%. In the UK, we have a dismal record of ocean conservation. We do have a new marine bill. We do have a new marine act that's ushering in this new generation of marine reserves. But even then, we're only going to be looking at about 5% of UK waters and only about 2.5% of coastal waters, inshore waters. So we've got a long way to go. So my little do is, is to ask you all to, to remember that you do live in a democracy and to use your voice. Because fundamentally, conservation isn't really about economics. It's not about subsidies. It's not about bottom trawling. It's not about bluefin tuna. It's about, it's about people. You can join a campaigning organisation. You can write to your MP. You can write to your MEP. You can become actively engaged in these issues from fisheries reform to marine protected areas to market and incentives. Even as a consumer, you can effect change. The Marine Stewardship Council, eco-labelling, the Fish to Food Guide, the Fish to Fork Network Restaurant, the Restaurant Network. These are all very, very useful market instruments that we can use as consumers to send the right signal back to the market. And for my big do, so this is for me and you, I want us to, to ask ourselves really, to, to what extent do we need to maintain this, this flow of fish to our tables? We could all give up fish tomorrow in the West and none of us would, wouldn't do any of us any harm and none of us would really suffer. That's not the same in the developing world where people depend on fish. But my point is that dealing with this problem, this incredible, incredibly critical issue, isn't the same as addressing the problem of global climate change. It's not going to require a wholesale rewiring of the way the economy and society functions. We could achieve this tomorrow, but we don't. We're told there'll be nothing left by the year 2048. This collapse is going to happen in our generation. Those of us able to work today and do something about it today, it's going to happen on our watch. We could reverse it, but we don't. So my, my challenge is, is to, my do is to ask us to challenge ourselves and, and to ask ourselves to what extent would we be willing to follow the risk of the Vesu, the courage of the Vesu, and to take a hit for conservation. To what extent would we be willing to take a risk for the future sustainability of our seas? Thanks very much.